you know, that's the one thing that I love about Disney is that they tend to put fans in charge of developing these new uh, reboots or these new properties. I mean, they do it at Marvel as well. You know, they put fans of the comics in, in these positions where they're writing for these characters and they care about them because those characters had an impact on them, you know, at whatever, you know, time in their life that they really resonated with them. And yeah, I don't know that, I don't know that they do that intentionally. It's just like, those fans are of the age of filmmakers who yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, grew up with the stuff. That's why they're in there pitching those projects. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, you know, I guess kind of, you know, looking at, um, you know, when you first started with Disney, how did you notice kind of the uh, company culture that helped uh, cultivate and inspire, you know, the creativity of its writers and its animators? Well, when I, I started literally three days out of college from my graduation, and they even oh, wow. said, are you sure you don't want to take a vacation? Because <laughs> you won't get one for a year. And I said, until I know I have the job, I'm not going to enjoy a vacation. Because when I started, it was starting a training program. You had like eight weeks to do a, a little film and learn animation at the same time. And then another eight weeks to do a second one and yeah. you know, if you survive those two you became an in-betweener which I was terrible as and almost fired over um anyway so the culture people don't realize how small Disney was because they think of it as in terms of today as this huge corporation and it's like the animation staff when I started was 55 people not counting the ink and paint ladies, as yeah. they were called, because it was still done on, you know, acetate uh, or cell uh, vinyl. Um, that's how small, 55 people turning out Sword in the Stone, Aristocats, Robin Hood, you know, that it was just these tiny people. And the movies came out once every four or five years, usually five, mm -hmm. I think. Um, as opposed to, you know, hundreds of people working on those shows now, digit when it's CGI or standard animation. Uh, so the culture was this leftover culture from Walt, except it had softened because there used to be, as we are told anyway, a, a pretty strict hierarchy of, you know, the top guys and then who's allowed to do what. And, um, that basically changed, it actually changed a lot just from the time I was accepted to the time I actually showed up on the doorstep. It was like a bunch of animators, young animators worked on um, a feature at Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. Mm -hmm. And the rule had always been, oh, if you do this much footage uh, in a picture, you are named an animator. If you do this much footage, you get a credit. And in what these guys did, because it was only a half hour thing, they basically animated the whole thing. And they said, we're out of here if you stick to that. So suddenly it was like, oh, wait, we have to change things. They're absolutely right. Yeah, you yeah. Know, this, isn't, this isn't fair. Which, of course, all those middle guys who had been there for 20 years already were going, wait a minute. How come we don't, you know, it's like, <laughs> dude, get on board and, and start moving ahead. So it was a different culture. The um, skipping, you know, 15 years in or whatever it was when I started at TV animation, it was more about we weren't sure what we were doing. And because we didn't have a lot of experience, certainly I had experience in television. I had come from feature films. Mm. Um, the creativity was just not doing things in the normal way because, especially story wise, because. You didn't know that was the normal way. I remember uh, uh, Ted Anasty and Patsy Cameron were story editors, actually probably the main story editors on DuckTales, along with Ken Kunz, David Weimers, and Jim Magon, who helped develop the show. Um, they we were, uh, we were talking about a magical item or something, and Ted and, uh, Ted and Patsy had been the story editors on Smurfs. And at the time, Smurfs had been the number one cartoon show for several years. Right. Uh, and they were just talking about magical items. They, and I forgot the context, but it was like, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, if there's, a magic, if there's a magical harp, you know, when Gargamel holds it, it's human size. And then you cut and the Smurfs are on it and it's their size. So they can play it. 
And my feeling was, and it kind of came from working with Eric Vitello, who co-created Gummies with Jim Agon and Jim. It was more like, but if Gargamel has to play a magic harp with a toothpick or Smurfs have to have eight Smurfs working together to play the magic harp because it's so huge, either one of those is more interesting than doing the cheat of just, you know, it's like, yeah. hey, here's, here's a cool thing that, that helps make it real that you didn't think of uh, that said so like, oh, wow, it'd be a magic item that you could hold in your pocket, but you just have to pick it, you know, to do it with a needle or something. Um, that's what more interesting. So it's kind of that sort of thinking of how do you make these things more real? And then conversely, when I did Darkwing Duck, it was, no, I want the tone of old Warner Brothers shorts. Yeah, yeah. Except with, with Disney heart and expanded to 22 minutes. And, you know, I had talked with an executive and they said, but how is there jeopardy if you can literally drop a sh safe on him and he's okay? Uh, how do you go to a commercial, you know, and have people come back to worried about him? And I said, because he'll look frightened and we'll play scary music. And that's it. <laughs> it was like, no, if you're entertaining enough, Every, everybody knows that Captain Kirk was going to survive. Right, right. Even if, he, even if he wasn't wearing a red shirt, or even if he had a red shirt, he was going to survive. <laughs> uh, in fact, Scotty was always, you knew he was coming back. That doesn't mean that there's no drama in the episode. I mean, you can right. look at that in most movies. You know James Bond is probably going to, you know, because you know the actor's already signed a three-picture deal. Uh, doesn't it seemed like the, they had, uh, the movie can't, you know, can certainly be thrilling. So yeah, well, it, was, it seems like they had just like the idea, like the old Batman TV shows on there. You know, where you're going to end with a cliffhanger and stay tuned next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Yeah. But uh, but I it's don't... like I mean that was such a silly show, but you still yeah. care about you know the character, or you're at least entertained by it. And that's what I. So think... it, a lot of that creativity was just the other thing that helped a lot is all the writers were on the staff writers anyway, and story editors were on term deals instead of uh, show deals. Meaning today, if you're hired, you're usually, although there's been a little change because Netflix keep hiring people away, um, you're gonna be hired onto SpongeBob. So you get a contract for SpongeBob and it's like, for the direct, and let's say you created it, and it's like, yeah, as long as you're doing SpongeBob, you're working for us. Yeah. Um, and you negotiate whatever you can within that if it passes a certain mark or whatever. But we were given term deals, meaning we will, we like your talent. We are going to give you a term deal of three years. Here's your salary raises for three years. And then we have an option for two. If we still like you at the end, we'll give you another two years at this salary so you kind of have to guess about the future and all that but the point right, is right. you got at least three years probably five if you're a main person where they own every idea that you come up with pretty much so what that meant is you could be called in to help out on another show just to brainstorm and stuff like that and that was really fun but it did help the creativity you know you could go to someone that you really liked working with on a show but they're currently assigned somewhere else and you can go out to lunch and talk about your show and, or even take work time, you know, to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, you know, bash ideas back and forth because that's somebody who knows how the studio works, who knows the kind of stories that are liked and all that, you know, it's more useful than, you know, going to an outside writer that you happen to know. You don't have to fill them in on anything. And especially yeah. if something that's supposed to be secret course yeah yeah you don't have to keep those ndas in your back pocket yes <laughs> <laughs> so so i guess let me ask you then um how were, well how were the writing rooms set up at uh, disney because you know i talked to uh roby goran who like wrote for uh you know funimation he-man and all that and he was saying yeah. how they kept all their writers you know in like these little solitary rooms working out one script to the other i would hope that disney's a little bit more collaborative did you guys have like writer rooms and stuff set up no, the, <laughs> I, I didn't think so. I visit. I visited the new Ducktales guys, and one of the first things because they have a writers' room that, 
breaks the entire season and then the room breaks each episode and then they assign the script to a, a writer and then yeah. it gets punched up by the group. Um, they asked me when I first visited, how big was your writer's room? And I laughed. I said, mm -hmm. it was me. And then whoever came in my office and pitched <laughs> stories and yell at each other until we come up with a story. And then we'd see, we'd pitch premises and see if they got through when we did it. And they said, our, our, uh, I found a script schedule that I sent to Frank Aragonis and, and, uh, you know, he said, oh, I'm pinning this on the wall and just waiting for writers to complain about the schedule. Cause we had to do an alternating weeks, two scripts were due one week, one script was due the next week, you know, went back and forth like that. It was just insane. And the idea of before there was pressures of production that you would have time to like, oh, let's kick around some ideas for the first 12 episodes or a season arc or something like that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, Gargoyles, Gargoyles had an ongoing story and seasons are, that was in Greg's brain, you know, Greg Wiseman. Um, he kept track of that. He worked it out. Uh, you didn't have time for that. It was just, you know, crazy. I, in fact, even at the time, I talked to uh, uh, some of our friends at Warner Brothers because the animation industry, you could have two companies that don't like each other or are competitors, but the writers go back and forth. Right. Uh, right. And I remember that we were talking about either Tiny Toons or Animaniacs, probably both, where they said, oh, yeah, we throw out about three or four scripts a season. And the idea that they had the luxury of having more scripts done than they had episodes. And if it wasn't working well, eh, let's just put this aside. We couldn't believe that they were allowed to do that. If we got to, you know, if it wasn't quite working, you did what you could. And then I'm sorry, it's got to go. And, <laughs> you know, and fix it in post. But you, if you came up with ideas, you'd go talk to the storyboard guy as he's trying to get it done. Uh, so it was a whole different system. Yeah. Um, and obviously the system today is much better. Now they feel they have a rush schedule too, but that's because they are so much more ambitious on what they're trying to do. Um, it's just fantastic. And the art side is more unified with the, at least on that show on DuckTales, uh, more unified with the writing side so that the art director knows to style things a certain way and in color because of the way the script is going, but they know that stuff before there's even a, an official premise out there because they'd been in on those discussions. So they'd mm -hmm. say, Oh, what if we designed the, I don't know, this villain's castle like this, because that feeds into this story point, you know, and then, you know, that's just the joy to me of my career was working with, creative teams that we put together to do these shows uh, and to have that kind of back and forth uh, with artists, you know. Yeah. Evan.